All right, you guys ready to resume and jump into the next section? Yes. I know some of you maybe weren't uh, entirely successful. I still am going to troubleshoot issues later, but um, I don't want to spend too much time there because we do have more ground to cover. And really the point was to try to make you aware of what developers will experience, what they will, um, what kinds of information they want to know, just to highlight the main thing is what kind of uh, requests are available, what kind of information comes back, and kind of a sense of how people would test out calls using Postman, Curl, what the response looks like coming back, how you can associate that with a web page, and then if we wanted to take it a step further, which you can on my site, you could actually um, take the information that comes back and print it to the page in a different area. That gets a little more into the JavaScript side than is really uh, worth it in workshops, but okay. <coughs> we have gone through, yes? It's not related to APIs, but okay. how did you do your slides? <laughs> well, you know what, I'm, I'm happy you asked that because I feel like I have the awesomest slides that, that, that uh, sorry, the package I'm using is one of the coolest packages for slides that nobody ever really asks. But it's this thing called Reveal.js. Um, and it's basically an HTML framework for doing slides. So the thing, the reason I like my slides is because um, basically you just write in HTML. So any image in my course is actually single sourced between like the course content and the slides. That's what I like about it. And because it's easy to update. Other than that, there's really not that much that's exciting about the slides, but yeah, they're, it's entirely HTML based. If you look at it, it's like just a heading tag with paragraph tag, and then this whole reveal JS framework makes it cool. I mean, there's actually, the CSS for you? yeah, I mean, it's like, this is the beige theme. But uh, there are certain commands, like if you hit F, it goes to full screen. There's even a speaker view where I can uh, open this up. Oh, nice. Uh, so forth, and it shows you the time, and there's like different ways to change the layout, even here. It's quite a nice thing. <coughs> even so, most people at conferences are like, please send me your PowerPoint uh, slides, and I'm like, <laughs> I don't have PowerPoint. Anyway, okay, documenting API endpoints. This section, uh, we will cover the main the main thing that's expected in reference documentation. The API, doc API documentation doesn't entirely consist of reference documentation, but it, it seems to be one of the most um, core aspects of a REST API doc site, and it's something that has a very consistent structure. Like API reference topics for, for REST APIs have very common characteristics. Um, in upcoming sections, we'll talk about the conceptual uh, topics in API docs, but now we're going to talk about the, the endpoints, those resource URLs that you submit. Uh, the term endpoint is often used to encompass like everything associated with those resource URLs. There are about five common sections in a reference topic. <clears throat> You've got a resource description. <laughs> an endpoint and method, uh, or resource URL and method, parameters, a request example, and a response example and schema. So when you have a new API to document, this should be your template that you, you tackle. You say, I need these information about each of these areas. <clears throat> We're going to go through each of these. <laughs> and provide some examples, and then, and then as an activity, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a sample API reference topic to analyze and find everything that's wrong about it. So that's, that's my new activity that I'm, I'm excited to try out. Oh. Okay, so resources refer to the information returned by the API. With the weather API that we were playing with, the resources returned were the information about the weather. And you saw that there were, I don't know, a dozen different APIs. Some of them returned information about the UV index. Some returned a relief map. This is just the resource that's available 
at that API that comes back. And of course, the documentation needs to describe what this resource is, what is returned by the API. Now, people call this whatever they want in the industry. Uh, you might, you're not going to open up every API doc site and see a section called resource description. Some of it will say API calls or endpoints or API methods or calls or, re or resources, uh, objects, services, requests, reference. Um, nobody really knows what to call these things, really. Um, I have called them sort of endpoints, but a lot of people just say reference, API reference. Anyway, uh, people recognize this more by the shape than by any specific name. Here are a few examples. Uh, this is an example with MailChimp. <clears throat> you can see they've got a you know, MailChimp as an email newsletter service. And, and they've got an API. In fact, almost every company has an API. If you just Google it and the word API, you'll find that, holy crap, everybody's got an API. Uh, but MailChimp's API allows you to create campaigns through an API. If you don't want to use their, their, uh, their tools, their GUI, or their GUI actually uses these, these APIs under the covers, I'm sure. But you can create a campaign, and so they have to describe this resource. What's a campaign? I have no idea. Is this a political campaign? Is this a... a uh, nonprofit campaign? No. Campaigns are how you send emails in your MailChimp list, blah, blah, blah. But the resource description is typically short because this is reference docs. It's what people refer to quickly as they <clears throat> use whatever software they've got or whatever project they've got. Here's an example from Box. Box is like uh, a way to store things online. And they have, they call these objects, but the membership object, they describe it as, as this. Membership is used to signify that a user is part of a group. Membership can be added, requested, updated, and deleted, and so forth. A few short sentences, it's usually action-oriented. You know, membership is like something you update with people. Uh, and in their design model, <clears throat> they decide to break out all the different actions that you can do with this membership resource into different, different uh, API endpoints here. Get membership, create membership, update membership, uh, and so forth. One more example from Eventbrite, which you all use to register. Here are their events. API describes it as follows. It, it allows you to retrieve a paginated response of public object events, and so forth. Again, short. Action-oriented can even be a fragment, just allows you to, and so forth. Uh, but that is essentially what a resource description looks like. Nothing too um, too difficult to grasp there. Can I ask a question yes. About that? Is is that really useful? Because can't the developer look and see the actions that can be accomplished? Would it be more useful to be something more descriptive about what an event is? Or is this just the way everybody does it? So. Um, there's probably a lot more to say about events. Um, and, and yeah, there might be a need to go on about it at more length. That typically is done in more of the conceptual topics of the That's guide. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you put too much information here, it becomes less scannable and easy to, to pick through the parameters and other sections. But yeah. Definitely, um, there's this other need for more detail, and, and that's why you have this whole other section that I call conceptual or non-reference info. All right, uh, second section is endpoints and methods. The endpoints indicate how you access this resource, and the method used with the endpoint indicates the allowed interaction, get, post, delete with the resource. So you've got this resource, events, whatever, how do, I, how do I access it? Well, the endpoint is that definition that you pasted into Postman in the get box or, or whatever. Uh, that, that URL is the endpoint. Literally, endpoint is kind of like the, the end path. You have this base path that is used for all, all calls. And the only thing that's different is this end point or path. And that's sort of what you're describing here. 
The method refers to <clears throat> the operation that you're doing with the content. Are you, are you creating something new? Are you just getting something, a read-only? Are you deleting something? Are you updating an existing thing? The most common methods are get, post, uh, put, and delete. So it kind of corresponds with CRUD, like create, uh, delete, and so forth, read, update. Here's an example from Instagram. This is very short, right? You've got the, the method on the left, get, followed by the <clears throat> endpoint on the right, not really named anything specifically in the UI, and I've highlighted them in yellow. Here's an example from Facebook. You've got achievements. It's just like the whole header is the endpoint, and this one actually has a parameter right in the, in the endpoint, achievement ID. Um, and doesn't actually say the method here, does it? Um, maybe that comes later in this topic. Here's an example from Box again. So you've got the the. Uh, hmm. Actually, this is probably not. The, oh, sorry. Okay. It's like where is it? They actually put it on the right. So this is a sort of display where you you put the the code on the right and the the concepts in the middle, but. This is actually where the definition is, slash comments. But they're calling it create comment, um, or comment object, and I happen to be on the create comment and so forth. So exactly how people refer to this stuff is a little slippery, right? Is this the comment endpoint with the create method? It might become a little bit of a mouthful, uh, depending upon what you're describing. Um, here's an example where what you call it is tricky. I once worked at a gamification company and we had endpoints that looked like this. You had a, a rewards endpoint where you had to specify a user ID and a mission ID, right? But we also had a missions endpoint where you could specify um, the rewards for that mission. So when I was describing it, I didn't really know how to, how to refer to it. The rewards resource with mission ID specified versus the mission ID with rewards specified. Um, Anyway, you might just refer to them in a way that makes sense for your API. The next section is parameters, and parameters are the options you can pass with the endpoint, such as specifying the response format or the amount returned in order to influence the response. When you did the open weather map sample request, we passed in the zip as a parameter, the app ID as a parameter, and the units as a parameter. There are lots of different parameters that you might have. And this is actually the most, probably one of the most important sections because developers constantly refer to the parameter section to know what data type the parameter is, what the parameter names are, their casing, uh, min, max values. But there, there are four types of parameters. Header parameters, like that Facebook one, it's passed right in the URL or the, the, the endpoint URL, and it's required as part of the endpoint. Um, that face, Facebook ID or whatever is, is required. A path parameter, oh sorry, my bad, scratch that. That's what a path parameter is. The path parameter is passed in the endpoint URL. A header parameter is actually something you don't really see. It's submitted in the header of the request. Um, the header of the request isn't so immediately apparent, but every time you go to a website, you're actually submitting a header of information about your browser, and other, other things about you, your location, your access, whatever. Um, and when you get a response, that response also has a <clears throat> set of um, headers as well that tells you things like the status code of the requests and, and what, what server you requested. Anyway, you can submit parameters in that header part of your request. The query string parameter, this also appears in the URL, it appears, it appears after the question mark. And then the request body parameters, a parameter that is submitted in another part of a request called the, called the request body, which we'll, we'll show here, an example. Here's a sample header parameter. Often you put the authorization key into this section in the header. Um, 
the path parameter, here's an example where user ID and bicycle ID would be path parameters. And these are, these are required. If you didn't have it, the endpoint wouldn't work. They're, not, they're never optional. Um, and, and I like to set these off like as a different color because otherwise it can be somewhat confusing. I mean, most people would look at that and say, of course, curly braces represents a field that you're supposed to customize, but not always. And then finally, query string parameter comes after the question mark. And these are usually optional. And their order doesn't matter. <clears throat> Here's a sample request body parameter. This is sort of just stands on its own. Um, remember when you talked about curl and I said there's a dash D parameter where you can submit data that would refer to a request body parameter? Well, if you wanted to pass in this request body in with a curl command, you would minify this, escape it, and stick it in right after that D in the curl command. Um, or in, well, I have Postman open. In Postman, there was this body part. <clears throat> Let me. Uh, yeah. Let me close this. Uh, reopen it. Uh, anyway, the he sorry, the header part here. You could submit header parameters. The body, you would, you would submit it here. For some reason, this isn't. This request does not have a body. I think maybe this endpoint is automatically not allowing it. I'm not really sure why it doesn't. Just let me type something there. But anyway, that's how you could submit it in Postman. Uh, but basically, the request body is often used when you're creating something. It's almost never used when you're just getting something. Let's say you're setting up a server, and, and there's a ton of parameters. Well, you would pass that as a request body. You could store this in another file, even. And then you could refer to that file in your curl call or, or your other code. Within parameters themselves, there are multiple data types. There's a string data type, which refers to any alphanumeric A, B, C, 1, 2, 3 type of um, string. Integer is a whole number. Boolean is a true or false. Object is a key value pair. An array is a list of things. And sometimes people are even more specific about the integer, although a lot of times in REST APIs it doesn't matter, but uh, they could specify um, uh, different types of numbers. And, and programmers are all, all about being very specific about the number because oftentimes there are limits that are expressed that way. <clears throat> There's actually a, another value sometimes people will say called number, which refers to like a decimal uh, that can have a lot of different places. Um, or they could, they could get even more specific and be like float, double, you know, whatever. But usually it's just integer because it's more simple. The query string parameter is totally, the order is totally irrelevant. If you had three, sorry, days equal three and units equal metrics and time equals 1400, it's the same as time equals 1400 and so forth. Um, but you couldn't swap the, the path parameters order. You couldn't say, oh, I'm gonna just throw the bicycle ID before bicycles. It's really exacting about what's allowed and what's not allowed. Any questions or anything? Yes. Now it should not change the response order. All right. Um, let's see. Here's a few, a few examples of parameters. Box specifies them in three different areas. Probably hard to see, but this says path params, query params, body params. They don't always call them by the full names, like it's not query string parameters. And you're, you're free to shorten things to sound you know, trendy. Call them params. <laughs> uh, the path, path is, is separated out from query. It tends to make it more uh, apparent that they're different. You know, uh, Here's an example from Yelp. Basically, they're just using a table, mostly. And you, you, you list the name, what type of data it is. Is it a string? Here they're using numbers, probably because you have decimal places. Whether it's required or optional, I think we're still searching for that that dis, that that key word that would would represent required slash optional. <laughs> anyway, uh, and then a description of it. So very simple, 
But online, you really can't have more than four columns in a table before it starts to become unreadable. So you could always lump these together. You could put like the data type in the description or something, uh, set it off with italics some way. Oops, thought I had one more slide there. Nope. Okay, the request example. Uh, request example includes a sample request using the endpoint, and it shows some of the parameters configured. Ideally, you would show all the parameters configured. Sometimes that's not possible because it, they don't like make sense together. Uh, but you should try to have like a full rich example shown. Here's an example. Call fire. They put it on the right. Um, and they've got curl shown as the sample request. Probably too small to see this, but basically this is the request in curl. Again, this is a design pattern where they put the, the code on the third pane and they put the conceptual stuff in the middle and they're supposed to kind of, uh, I am not a huge fan of this format, but a lot of people do like it. Anyway, curl is their, their way that they're showing what parameters you can pass and so forth. Here's an example from parse where they have an example request shown in curl and here they put the backslashes in there. Fortunately, they use double quotes. Uh, but they, they want to make it readable. You can see, oh, this is, takes two header parameters specified by the H <coughs> and a data parameter. So this is, this is updating something, and here's the data that we're updating with. And uh, yeah, the, this data parameter, you could also store this in a file that you just refer to, and it would pull it there. It's kind of nifty. Uh, here's an example from Twitter. Now, Twitter, they just are bare bones about it. They like it's barely even readable, but they just put the method on the left and uh, put the request there with a few parameters. Um, sometimes you might want to put multiple requests. This is from New York. No, this is from the City Grid API. So they have lots of different use cases. You want to find movie theaters, Italian restaurants, hotels in Boston. If you have a complex endpoint, you might want to put several examples about how it's used. And, and you, you, know, you could just stack them there. Uh, another facet of the whole request example uh, part of API docs is that they often will show the requests in different languages. If you want to make it easy for people working in Node, they just copy and paste the request. Um, there you have it. If you just wanted to show it in curl, that's fine too. But uh, sometimes people like to show like half a dozen languages um, and how to make the request in those languages. Remember when I opened up Postman and said, you've got this code thing with all the, the different ways to make the request. Well, these are auto automated. So uh, it's not as if, if you can't programmatically generate these. Um, so it's not really that useful in my opinion, and people who are working in a language will typically know how to submit requests in that language. Uh, but it is kind of a nice to have feature. And if you wanted to go the extra mile, you could develop a system where when the user is logged in, if their API key is available, you could automatically like pull it in so that it's really literally copy and pasteable. That, that's available in some platforms, but probably not worth it. I uh, just showed that. All right, yeah. So you were talking about the different languages. So you're documenting your API. Do you know that your user, you don't know what your user is using, do you? As far as yeah, you yeah, you, you probably, probably don't, right? If, so that's why they give multiple. Yeah. Languages. Now, usually, though, usually every API has a specific use case they're targeting, and they know that developers often build apps using such and such language. Mm -hmm. So you'll have like maybe two to three or even just one target language. And if that's the case, then it would make sense. But yeah, if you just like have, it depends on your product. If it's so like broad that it could literally be used in anything, then yeah, you, you might not even want to go that route, to be honest. Um, and and uh, some tools will auto-generate these code samples, like readme.io will auto-generate them. You could just go into Postman and like copy and paste the different snippets, but I think showing it in curl is probably good enough. The more code you have, the harder it is to maintain, you know. Uh, now, 
some people will also integrate something called an API Explorer that will let you put in the request and see the response dynamically. We'll talk more about API Explorers later, but this is the New York Times API, and you know, rather than just give you one sample request, it's like, hey, use anything and you'll see immediately how it appears. We'll, we'll talk more about that later. One, one thing to be aware of is that requests can be dangerous. I was once working on, a, on an API where, that uh, allowed people to order products. This was for something called Dash. Uh, you you, you want to know when your printer's running out of ink and you want it to automatically order you new stuff, right? Or your refrigerator, you've got a, those fancy fridges with an LCD panel, you're low on something, and it automatically like reorders it. Well, this API, um, like the way it was developed, when you submit a request, you really did get an order. You couldn't just have a test thing uh, going on. And so as I was playing around with it, I was like, why am I getting all these email notifications about orders that have been shipped and stuff? They're like, ah, you know, be careful. And it turned out they'd actually removed the requests from the documentation because like, they didn't want people passing them in. In a later version, they created a test flag that made it safe, but still they tried to, um, they tried to sort of like pawn it off, pawn the documentation off without any request examples because they didn't want people executing them. Uh, and, and some other companies, I believe IBM um, had a bunch of APIs that they specifically like didn't want the requests to be executable in the in the documentation because you know people start creating things and they don't realize that they're creating it with their account. Then later you're going to have to like delete it or wipe it, and it's you know not always easy. Anyway, all right, the last section, and then we'll jump into our fun activity is the response example in schema. This shows the sample, or the response that comes back from your sample request, and the schema shows all possible elements that come back in the response. Um, <clears throat> here's a great example from SendGrid. They've got like two tabs. On the right, you've got the example, which should correspond with the sample request, but that sample request might not be comprehensive of everything that could be returned, right? And you wanna describe. That. Well, that's what the schema is for. <coughs> the schema is a comprehensive way of listing out, these are all the possible objects, this is the data types that, they, that each object is. You're getting a string back here, you're getting an integer back here. Um, it even tells you if this, this element is required or optional in the response. Does the server, is the server required to respond with this? Maybe, maybe not depends on things, and they describe it. And this is really where you, you can tell if documentation is good or not. If it's good, they will describe everything that comes back in the response. If it's bad, they just throw an example, and we'll have a bunch of cryptic like abbreviations in the response, and they won't bother to tell you what they mean. The segment IDs are the segment IDs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course everybody knows this. Actually, one API I worked on, um, they specifically went to lengths to uh, make the responses cryptic because, like, depending upon the tier of package you had, different things meant different, uh, they had different meanings, and uh, they didn't want people to know what they were kind of missing out on. I, and then they wanted to save space. They're like, oh, we need this to be very fast. And so I spent weeks trying to track these down. The programmer's like, I don't know what that means. I'm like, how do you not know what that means? You're creating this API. <laughs> then when, when I did have a list, they were very excited about it. <laughs> like, anyway. Question. Yeah. Um, when you spoke about the first example, you told that it would be dangerous because people can start executing them. Yeah. Um, is it not possible to come up with like test request examples or like models? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's really what people need to do. I'm saying, um, Sometimes users, the, the, the workflow is for them to create their own API key, their own account, like with uh, that open weather map. We created our own account. We had our own API key. And who knows if, uh, let's, say, let's say we were doing some kind of put request to create some weather information. We would think, oh, we're doing this to test and to learn. And then when we want to go live, we want to remove all that test data. Sometimes companies don't think that through and then and then it becomes a headache later. So yeah, it, providing test accounts is, is kind of crucial to that whole 
try it out um, mode. Here's, a, here's an example from Sunrise and Sunset. This is an API. And this, this shows the, the example through Swagger. Uh, this, we'll talk more about Swagger later, but there's a section in the response where you can toggle between an example value and the model, which is another name for schema. You can see in the example value, it shows all the different results in the sample value. And if you toggle over to the model, it says, uh, you can collapse and expand it, but it says the data type, <coughs> an example, and a description. Um, and here's, here's a great example of where the schema differs from the sample request. Here, the status, it says there are four possible statuses. You could get OK, invalid, invalid date, and so forth. Whereas in the example, they're only going to show one status, OK. Right? So if you're just reading this, if all you had was the example, you say, my status, it, what other options are possible? You wouldn't know if it weren't described. So that's where the schema comes in. And other things like, how do you know, how do you know what time format is really? I have no idea if that's like UTC or what, right? But if you flip over to the model and I go over to time, it should like have a, a description of the time format. This one doesn't. It's bad documentation. <laughs> okay. And oh, just show that. One thing that is difficult about these about these uh, responses is that a lot of times you'll have nested objects. Remember how that went? Well, some parameters can be objects within objects within objects, and sometimes those nested objects are repeated a number of times. It can be really tricky to try to figure out how you display that. Uh, in this example, um, ah, sorry, right here, you've got name details slash to show that given name appears underneath name details. It's kind of their convention. Surname is inside of name details. This is kind of fine here, but what if you had like three different, four different levels? It sort of becomes tricky, right? This is why they only have two columns in their table. <laughs> They're probably like, yeah, uh, any more columns and this thing blows up. Here's an example where they, they put it side by side. They're like, we're going to put the code here, and we're going to put all the the schema or the model here, and you click a thing, you click a, a property, and you get the description, which is kind of cool, except for now you can't do control F and scan it. You have to mouse over each one, so people will complain that way, right? Or you have this other problem where uh, description kind of lines up with description here, but what if, like, I don't know, um, what if it gets really out of alignment? For example, well, this is a good example where it's still in line, but I often see where like the left and the right are like inches apart, so it's not very scannable. But uh, here's another example where you've got this tripane design. On the left, you've got the, the descriptions of the schema. On the right, you've got the code example, the sample requests. So it's kind of a kind of a cool way um, to show both. You know, with the send grid, we had the the tab, one called example, one called schema. Here's just another design. OK, so putting it all together, let's say that you have this sample endpoint. In the course I have online, I, I have this sample endpoint called surf report. Um, let's say the open weather map people came to you and said, uh, Jim or whatever your name is, we've got a new API for you to document called surf report. What do you deliver to them? Something that might look like this. You've got a description, you've got some end, uh, the endpoints, uh, the parameters broken out, a sample request, a sample response, and then a description of el every element in the response, some kind of hierarchy reflected. And that's pretty much it. And you can see here the table is messed up. But uh, that's, that's what the reference docs sort of look like. Questions? Are we ready for the activity? OK, now, you just soaked it in. You know exactly what to look for. You're going to go to activity 3A. <coughs> You're going to put your editor hat on. Sorry. Uh, so under intro workshop activities, 3A. What's wrong with this API reference topic? If you click this and open it up, it's a Google Doc. 
And uh, you should be able to access it. Uh, if you don't have a Gmail account or a Google account, it might be hard to clone it. But uh, you could always just take it locally, too. I want you to make a copy of this. We'll go to File, Save, Download. No, sorry. File, Make a Copy. And then go through and, and annotate stuff. In Google uh, Docs, to annotate things, you just highlight it. And then do Insert Comment or Command Option M. So you highlight it and say, blah, 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 something's wrong, right? So there are at least 20 things that are wrong in this topic. Actually, I've, I've got 25, but I'm sure you'll, you'll add another dozen by the time we're done here. So go through, take 15 minutes, go through this, and see if you can find as many things wrong with it as possible. <clears throat> and make your, make your comments. So you're, you're making all your comments in a in a, a copy of it so that other people don't see. And, and I do have an answer key online, so don't go fishing around in the course site for it, right? Um, <laughs> try, to, try to see how much you can, you can spot. Okay, so we'll go until 11.15, and then resume, and, and we'll go through it and f pick through all the problems. Yeah, everything wrong. Could be like, oh, um, could be the wrong data type, could be some missing information, could be a typo, yeah, anything. Pretend you're, you're the editor of an API doc group. All right, uh, I know I said 11.15, but I'm thinking maybe... Maybe 10 minutes is enough. Do you guys want more time or do you? Okay. All right. Uh, I have an answer key that <clears throat> I've commented on stuff, but why don't you tell me what's wrong with it? Dude is misspelled. Dude is misspelled? Yeah. I, think, I think they say it do. Like, do. You don't say the second D. Oh, it's intentional. <laughs> Yeah, okay, which one? Um, well, some that I found was um, the beach ID parameter is missing, the zip is not a parameter, and the app ID is not Okay, yeah, the zip appears there <coughs> in the sample request, but it's not listed as a parameter in the parameter section, good. The beach ID, theoretically, it was supposed to be one, two, three, four, five. <clears throat> and often path parameters don't, don't have anything that sort of denotes them, but it's potentially confusing, yeah. Yep, sorry. The first one, um, if you scroll up, I thought that the first information, the description, was more of a resource description, and it says, it calls itself an endpoint. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, this, the description is problematic. I mean, it's, I mean, uh, beyond just the ambiguity there that you're describing. What, what, uh, like, what else is wrong with the description just in itself? It's kind of like I, what I asked earlier was, you know, it's more conceptual. It shouldn't be at this level. This should be more action oriented. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Yep. It looks like a get operation and it says get post. Yeah. And then the syntax for the five parameter. Yep. Yep. Good, good. All right. Anything else? What else are you finding? Yep. The like, syntax stuff, there's like some use of like slant quotes and some places where quotes are missing the sample response. Yep. So missing here under for extreme? And where else? Uh, so that one that's also missing, it's also missing a comma, but then like yep. the, the, it's using slant quotes around rectide, which would be straight quotes. Yeah, wow, good one. Good catch. And riptide is missing on the 3 p.m. <clears throat> yep, riptide is missing there. Mm -hmm. Anything else? 
Oh, sorry. In the back, in the pink. So this might be really picky, I don't know. But on the end point, Okay. Yep. And then the parameter doesn't have any. Yeah, yeah. So this little, like, there's a space and a colon, and it's kind of weird, right? All right, anything else? So I thought, way in the far back. Yep. Yeah. So this ISO should be integer, right? Yeah. 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 You're right. You're right. Time should be a string. It doesn't even say the type, and the, and then you have number and integer, and it's like, are those just they pick different things? I I doubt the beach ID is a decimal. Other people? Yes. In the front. Or, or wait, no. You've had your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, good. Good. Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay. All right. All well, you guys are getting getting most of them. Anybody else? Yep. And in the response definition, um, if you go to D, Yeah, no, that's you're right. That should just be string, right? Yeah. Yep. String is also capitalized. Oh. Right below it, the lowercase, the yep. lowercase, capitalized, yeah. What is an object data type? Would that be like a graph? Um, well, actually, you know what? Now that I look at this, now that it is an object, because like Monday, see how it's got the curly brace? It contains all this stuff. Um, so it is an it is an object, but I put map here, which is different, didn't I? Yeah, so map, sorry, it's, it's an object, but a map, uh, oh man. Sometimes people use map to refer to kind of object stuff, but it's more of a Java-ish term, but it probably should just be like object. Yep. It seems like somebody might have said this, I didn't hear, but the units are missing from most of these. <clears throat> Temperature, tide, yeah. wind. Yeah, definitely. You don't know like what units it, they are at all, right? Yeah. Yeah. Inconsistency between int or integer. Any others you guys hone in on? What is an object data type? It can be a key value pair. So it's uh, in the curly brace, a key value pair. I think map refers more to like the input object in a, some kind of like thing you would input, not necessarily that's coming back. So, so yeah, this, uh, the, this Monday contains a curly brace with a bunch of stuff, so that's going to be an object. Um, you couldn't say that Monday is just a string because it's coming back more than that. It's key value pairs. Anything else? Yep, in the back. Yeah. I don't know if anybody said this, but moderates and quotes, extreme is not. Does that matter after? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. And and uh like all all extreme should be in quotes and they should be straight quotes. Uh that actually was unintentional. I just pasted it from somewhere. <laughs> but uh that's a good catch. And and while we're on riptide, is is riptide described anywhere? In, no. no, it's it's not. Okay, any other other things you found? Yep. Sort of related to units. I have no idea what number they correspond. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, at the top it says day is the number of days to right. return. Okay. So we have, we're, we're overloading day. <laughs> Sorry, what? We don't know when that, start, when that count of day starts from. Right. Does that start from today or? <laughs> Yeah. Surrounding today, you know, you know, one and a half before. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It does, it's very, very brief, huh? It doesn't really describe that at all. 
For the time? For the I'm sorry, tide. Oh, for the tide. Yeah, 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 <laughs> definitely. Because yeah, the description is like saying it's going to be a number there, but then we say string. Good. The same with water temp. We don't even know type of. Um, yeah, this should be a, 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 a an integer as well. Anything else? You guys, you guys basically got pretty much everything. The answer key here. Um, even at the very beginning, surf report like. If you wanted to be more specific, it probably shouldn't be capitalized because the endpoint itself is just like all lowercase, right? But this intro is super wordy. A lot of stuff, knowing whether the conditions are optimal is necessary in every surfer's life. Like, get to the point, you know, tells us conditions about the wind and the surf height and all that. The endpoint, right? It should just be get, not get slash posts. Get rid of this little colon and it's kind of nice if you color code these. That's sort of an extra design thing. Uh, parameters are just all combined. Really, it's better if you separate out the query string from the path parameters. The beach ID is a path parameter. Put it in, a, in its own table, or at least call it out more. Um, the beach ID is it's kind of unclear where you get these. It's like uh, you're just supposed to know what the ID is. This is, doesn't really explain it. Yeah, later on, it's like in the responses it mentions some kind of park geo database, which I just made that up. I don't, I don't know if there is one. Um, but yeah, a lot of these are just really, really vague. There's the time, uh, even as an input parameter here, uh, it should list like minimum and maximum values as well as a default value. What's the default if I don't put anything? And and how much can I put? A thousand days? A million days? It's like what? What is it? Yeah, yeah. Like all this stuff is is these are details to ferret out when you're working through these, right? It's just it's just eye towards the meticulousness of looking at what's the default, what's the minimum, the maximum, what data type is allowed, what comes back, describing what comes back, and whether that you know we didn't even talk about <clears throat> what was required or optional in the response, but that could be another one. This time format. Um, like we've got some examples of time, but not examples of the others. It's a little inconsistent, and as you pointed out, there's no data type listed here. It's just ISO eight six zero one. The description for time here and then in the response definitions are like pretty inconsistent. Yeah, yeah. The time I mean here, the time is like one p.m., but the time here is like specified as a as a full ISO format. With the time zone and everything, the sample request only has days as a parameter. It doesn't even have um, time as a parameter shown, and it has extra parameters not described. It even includes an app ID that's functional. Like usually, you would shorten this to just like something in full caps that says app API key. Uh, let's see, oh, the request is not actually shown in curl. It should at least show that in curl format so that people could could do the requests and see um, how to immediately put it in there. Riptide, first of all, the formatting is wonky here, but uh, Riptide is uh, something returned in the response that's never described in the response, nor, nor are the possible values described. Uh, you caught this one about that. Let's see. Yeah, I already did that. Where are some others? Oh, there's no real hierarchy shown in this table, even though Tide is if you look in this response, tide is under the day, but they don't really indicate that here. Um, maybe you could put like day in curly braces slash tide or something, some other approach. And then the, the, the unit says people called out are not indicated 15 what knots or whatever wind is described in miles per hour. Same with water temperature, surf height. Is it surf underscore height or surf height? What should it really be? And the recommendation is fun, but it's like, how, how do we know how many strings there are or what they even mean? It's like, it's very vague. <laughs> and should dude have a second D or not? Just kidding. <laughs> then, yeah, you guys got all this. All right, so, so yeah, um, you know, the reference stuff is like, uh, there's, there's a method and, and an approach to it, right? You've got these 
clear sections, things you're looking for in each section. You've got an ability to sort of analyze to see whether it's complete or whether it's poorly written, right? This sort of, on the surface, this looks like it's okay. It's got substance, it's got descriptions, but when you start digging into it, you realize all the inconsistencies and the, the vagueness and things that are just wrong or missing. And, uh, you know, that's the heart of what, what you, you end up doing in the reference stuff. Any questions? All right, now we've got one more activity. And this is to evaluate, kind of identify, ba basically identify these five elements in an API doc set. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to pick an API. Um, I've got a list of about 100 here. If you expand activity 3, whoops, 3B. Uh, expand 3B, and where it says list of about 100 API doc sites, or you could choose your own company's API or some API that you, you might like. <clears throat> and you will try to identify a, where is a reference docs, the, the reference endpoint documentation. And then in that documentation, can you find these five sections? Remember I said the terminology varies considerably. You might be stunned that like, they've named them so differently or, or they don't seem to be there. So just try to find each of those five sections in one API doc site of your choosing. And you can choose, I've, I, I sort of collect them here, um, but uh, I give you like seven minutes to, to kind of sort through that and try to, try to find them. And then, and then you'll share like any observation you have about, about that. Um, so the list, if you're in the workshop activity 3B, uh -huh. <coughs> step one, in, in an earlier uh, version, I tried to have people do an open source project, identify one, but choose the second link. What, why don't we circle back and share some stuff? I'll, I'll just talk through what I was looking at. <clears throat> I was looking at the Stripe API because um, I constantly hear it, it, it kind of held up as a, as a good standard. And, they have a different approach here, actually. In the charges endpoint, <clears throat> uh, they start by describing what comes back in the response, essentially the, the response schema. These are all the possible things you could get back, and they describe them pretty well. They even have little collapsible stuff for children. But after they describe what you can get back, then they go through each of the possible uh, endpoints within this resource. Create a charge, retrieve a charge, they, they put out the, uh, they call them the parameters arguments. Um, and they describe them fairly well. Required, they don't really tell you the data types, but at least they're, they look fairly lengthy descriptions, so I'm sure you can figure it out. Um, then on the right, they show the response. There's no definition for the response because it's already described in the object. So a little bit of a reverse order, actually, but it, it seems like it makes sense, and then you can choose your language for the, for the code, and, and, uh, and, and yeah, anyway, it's actually quite, quite nice. A little bit weird to jump around it because so much is on the same page. I don't really like that where the whole thing is this monolithic page, but a lot of people do it that way. What is Stripe? It's like a payment API if you want to accept payments on your site. Um, they, they handle all the merchandising. I, I don't know, I've not really used Stripe myself because I don't have a need, but I think it's quite popular. Do you know how they make a little widget on the right um, so you can change the language? I'm assuming that's something you can build. I bet, I bet they built this themselves. Like, I don't think there's any widget you just could, could grab. Different doc sites might have this available by default, like the readme.io or, or um, some others that are popular. But yeah. Um, this is, I mean, they've done a lot. They've obviously got a front-end designer or some web developer like putting this together. I doubt it's the doc people. They even had a, a, a little like feedback thing. Yeah, was this was this section helpful? Yes, no. Anyway, all right. What do you, share some of your findings? What did you what did you find with your API that you were looking at? 
You said that they mixed get, get and post. Any, uh, what, let's start out. What API did you look at? Anybody? Uh, yes. I looked at Groupon, and okay. then Groupon has many, and so I specifically looked at the DL API. Okay. Um, they have an introduction, they have terms. I think the terms equates to uh, your resource. Okay. And then, um, then um, parameters are um, listed. They have very many different types. It's much more um, detailed as far as they have performance improvements and they have URL, they have URL parameters and different types of calls organized <coughs> in different ways. You know, it's organized out more specifically. Yeah, you can see they, they call things differently across sites, right? You just said URL parameters, which I'm guessing are query string parameters and yeah. other people. I mean, here they've, in Stripe, they call them arguments, not even parameters, which is more of like a programmer type term. So it's um, like REST presents such a difference from, from the previous models where everything was much more exacting. That's why the docs, I mean, every doc site looks as different as every website looks different from each other. It's like, instead of Java docs where everything, oh, you know exactly what it looks like, you know what to expect, you have no idea what you're gonna find with the API docs. Okay, what else, what else did you, uh, what other sites did you guys look at? Somebody else had their hand raised. Go for it. I looked at my company site and I was actually pretty impressed how it held up to your criteria. Oh, nice. So which uh, company site was that? Um, it's developer.mypurecloud.com. My Pure Cal? Uh, Pure Cloud. Pure Cloud, okay. So I, I work with um, that team a lot. And we have a couple of writers who contribute to it, but I've never looked at it that closely. So. Huh. Did they use the same terminology, or did they have their their own unique terms? Or what? Uh, a lot of it was pretty similar to what you had. Yeah. Oh, nice, yeah. nice. Oh, that's good to hear. I mean, I, I think in some form or fashion, these sections should be present in the reference documentation, no matter what they're called or how they're sort of uh, handled. Anybody else in uh, in the back first? I too looked at my own name. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I mean. <laughs> um, and it, it mostly kind of lines up. I, I just had a question. They have two sections, three sections actually um, consumes, produces, and tags. Huh. Yeah. That, yeah. Maybe that's specific to. This no, that's, that's kind of cool. So consumes is the request, I assume, like the request and the parameters, what you're putting in, and the produce is what's coming out, the return. And what was the third one? Tags? It's probably just a way of, is that a swagger thing? That's usually the way of grouping endpoints. But uh, if you have lots of them, we'll get into that soon. Cool, cool, yeah. I mean, uh, wow, consumes, produces. Yeah, that's cool. Makes sense. used in other, you know, with programs, the term consumes. Yeah, it's weird. All right, anybody else? Sri. Um, I looked at the Zomato API. Okay. Then um, the description uh, in most of it, they they mention like what um, each field is supposed to do. Yeah. And then for some of it, they don't have the description, and they also have like a model and a model schema of how it is supposed to look. Yeah. Um, and the use of the um, the curly bracket and the um, regular box bracket is. Um, interchanged or like inconsistent. Like huh. in, in one of the examples, I noticed that uh, in the model they use the brackets in a different way um, and they don't close it, but then in the model schema it is closed. Yeah. Like yeah. things <laughs> like that. And um, they have like separate section for API credentials. So if you actually go into the documentation, um, and try out something, it just keeps telling you invalid key, but unless like you go through the whole site, you don't know that you need to like actually uh, generate a credential. Cool, yeah, I, I played around a bit on that side, I think. Isn't it like restaurant reviews or yeah. restaurant info? 
And it's like pretty bare bones uh, info, but uh, it's got a lot of different parts of the, like aren't there a lot of different requests you can make or something? Yeah, like by they city? have like a lot of things. Like for instance, they have like categories like cities and cuisines and everything, but then um, a lot of the queries or like the tags that they use are, they don't exactly match uh. what they're talking about. Huh. Um, and, uh, and it says that there is an option to using the coordinates of any location within a city, but they don't have that in their model scheme. Huh. Well, that's good that you're picking up on that. Like you guys have got this mindset of really being exacting about you know what, what's between the requests and the responses. That's great. That's great. Anybody else want to share their what they looked at? Yes. Do you want to go first because you're in the okay. First? We'll go, Greg. So one of the things I'm looking at Splunk. And theirs is an expanding, collapsing mm. display, which can be annoying at times. But they've got a little download as PDF. Oh. And then I guess that's download topic as PDF. And then they have download the whole thing as PDF. Interesting. So, okay. so that's kind of interesting. Yeah, I haven't seen the PDF uh, option for many docs. And, uh, and they're good about telling you what the units are. But then they're not good about telling you what the data format is, whether it's oh. a string or an integer. Or... So, an interesting mix. All right. I looked at LinkedIn, and it looks like they only have one API. So they have, their organization is nothing like what you've shown us, because they just kind of go through the one API mm. and give a lot of examples. And permissions, there's three levels of permissions, so they have a section for that. And they're going to have a section for their field references because they can return a lot of information hmm. depending on what you want. So it is. You know, I I, I think. Very organized. <laughs> I know that LinkedIn has a lot of internal APIs. I, I've chatted with people who work there, and I think they had like hundreds of internal APIs that populate their own site used by their own engineers, and they were like really trying to build up their doc team to document all these internal APIs. They're like, we've got dozens and dozens of teams. They all need to you know, like document their services. But you know, internal docs rarely get the attention that external do. And so it was like, it's really a big challenge. I don't, I don't really know how they solved it. OK, Red, we'll, yep. Patricia. Sorry, Patricia. <laughs> They have, well, when you make get access to token calls, set the authorization header to these credentials, they're not giving you an example. Hmm. So you're kind of, you're having to fish for the information, and I, I don't like that. Um, it, you know, I guess maybe it's written by somebody hmm. that's not Interesting. integrated into the development team that much. But I, I like it, but I just, I don't. I don't think it's clear enough. You know, it's it's fascinating just to hear all the different experiences because the doc space is so different from, from previous <laughs> API docs. I mean, it, it, programmers are used to having a very defined set of annotations <laughs> that they put in their code. You put an at symbol and whatever uh, params, and, and you define it in the code, and it spits out a display that's the same, whether it's Doxygen or Javadocs or a few others, right? And that's it. And now API docs have become so different. And people are like all over the map. They're like, well, what's the best design? You can see people, I'm sure they've had endless discussions at these top companies like Stripe and Twilio on best practices for designing this. And, and it's so varied, which really speaks to why this is such a popular topic, because nobody knows how to do it right. It's like, there's, they, they know the general shape of information, but how do you present it? Do you put the, 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 you define the response up top and then explain how to call it, or do you define that later? Do you put a three column design and have people look at the con concepts in the middle, the code on the right? 
th this variation is exactly why I'm here. This is why we have a workshop because there's something to discuss. It's not just like, oh, this is the protocol you must all learn. Now it will work. And there's no discussion. It's like there's a lot of a lot of things to decide on. And a lot of things, a lot of room for people to make mistakes, to not mention the data type, to not mention defaults, min, max, you know, to not describe responses. Because there's just kind of all up in the air, right? You got a blank page in the back. Yeah. <clears throat> there's not there's not an API doc style guide. There is what I'm sort of driving towards and leading us towards is, is the open API specification, which is the way that people have tried to bring standards into this space. And it's the best way. And it's the reason why it's taking off. But it doesn't really specify um, terms in an absolute way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, you call them arguments or parameters. Like even fundamental thing as as that is totally split. Yes, Patricia. So I um, I have a comment. Um, I've been documenting a CLI reference guide for my company. We do metering, and they and, and engineers are very specific, right? And often I feel that they want too much information in the sub set up tables and everything. But it's like, so how, and that was kind of a spin off of what you said. You know, how do you define what is too much information and what do you, you know, how, how do you reference what standard can we reference? You know, there are industry standards as well. You know, my, my field is very specific. But um, so, you know, how do you kind of argue against what these engineers want to put in this? Yeah. And they, they almost give too much information, in my opinion. And they're not really asking the users. They're saying, well, you know, you need to update this. This document hasn't been updated since 2012. And they said, yeah, you need to do a, an update in case they ask for it. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, yeah, great. I'll add this to my things to do. And it's like almost 300 pages. And I've reformatted everything in FrameMaker, which is yeah. incredibly <laughs> fun. So. How do you argue against that when they're pushing you in one direction and they're just telling you? Yeah, yeah, and that that's like leads into this whole reason why it's such a hot topic because you have some engineers who might think, oh yes, this is the way to go, and you've got to call these objects and you've got to call these uh, doohickeys or whatever, and they're just like because that's how they learned it, and they just assume that's how it must be, and they don't. People often don't realize that like things vary so radically from site to site. And there is this desire to have a standard so that you can go to them and say, no, it should be done like this. And even though I'm not an engineer, this is how it should be done. And how do you get that backing? Well, this is where the open API comes in. Not just as a way to get backing, but as a way to try to provide a standard around this specification. I mean, part of the reason why REST APIs are popular is because they have this flexibility. It, it, the whole idea of a one-size-fits-all API is very, I mean, who's going to buy into that? You've seen, seen the variety from site to site, um, but, but giving people that flexibility to design their API in the way that they need allows it to thrive. Um, it's kind of like with Docs' code tools for, for building doc sites. They're so flexible, so you can do whatever you want with them. But with that flexibility, there's also an easy way to sort of um, get get uh, buried in, in lots of decisions and trying to figure out the, the right direction to go. So the next section we're going to jump into is um, <clears throat> the Swagger section. We're going to go into why, why Swagger, what it is, sorry, Open API and Swagger, what it is and, and how you use it. And uh, we're, we have lunch here in a few minutes, so I don't want to jump into this too much. But I'll just start out by saying the Open API basically has these five sections we've been going through, a way to describe it, to list the, the methods, the res response, and so forth. And it provides a way for you to um, uh, follow industry standards, at least for the reference information in your API, that is becoming extremely popular. So we'll dive into that. 
Uh, after lunch, we've got a few more sections. We've got, um, <clears throat> we're going to go into the open API part. Then we'll jump into the conceptual content in Docs. This is, thing, this is things like uh, describing how to get your API keys so you can authorize requests, rate limiting, uh, what you, how you add an overview and a getting started section. We're going to talk briefly about publishing and then, and then getting a job in API Docs. So these, actually four more sections. Uh, I tend, to, I tend to shorten the uh, publishing one, depending upon people's interest in that. But uh, we'll see. We're here till at least 4.35. So. All right. Um, I'm going to let Christina or Giuseppe tell us about the lunch protocol. Maybe we have 10 minutes before then. But uh, yeah, really maybe we can. I think it should be here right now. Just, yeah. OK. Yeah. OK. So we have lunch until 1. Okay. Yeah. Um, about the um, style guys that we're so used to, it's like IBM or Microsoft, which are huge companies, and so therefore we think um, we'll follow them because they have such a reputation and they're such a huge company. But it seems like this whole API space is focused on little companies that want to communicate with each other. Everybody has an API, and so the fact that nobody wants to look to Big Blue to figure out how to do it, they're mm. all doing it a different way. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. You're right. Like we don't have the big monolithic companies to set standards. There's, I mean, this is this is a space where the small companies are are thriving. You have a very specific API, and and uh, that's all they do, and they're like specialists. You know, it's this whole fragmentation on the web where everything's a mashup of eight to ten APIs on every site coming together. Um, well, isn't yeah. this very similar to pre Jitta where? You had people doing XML in all different ways, and someone said, you know, we should probably standardize this a little bit, create a Probably, create yeah. Standard. You know, isn't that yeah. kind of like where yeah. we're headed? Yeah, I mean, I, I think probably Docs evolved in a similar pattern, right? Where you've got, what was it, SGML SG, to, yeah. to XML and DocBook and Dita and all this desire for standards, and then people rebel, and they're like, ah, this is way too tight and structured, and it doesn't let me do anything. We have open, marked down. It's like, yeah, it's a, it's a constant uh, balance between the two. You would end also be not invented here syndrome. A lot of times yeah. they want to do it themselves. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm asking about API docs. I would like to not, if there is something, you know, that we can at least use as our guidance. I think, now, yeah, in, in terms of that, that API style guide, you know, I, I, there, there might be stuff online, but definitely nothing that's adopted as widely as the open API spec. And in as much as we can pull terminology from the open API spec, that's about as standard as it gets. But even, even the open API spec will use terms like paths instead of like endpoints or resource URLs. It will use some things that are unfamiliar, but it will, it will largely use somewhat standard terminology. And if you stick close to that, it tends to get easy engineering buy-in. And um, you can even have engineers write to it. That's another thing, right? If you don't want to be in the business of doing this, I mean, it's very formulaic. You've got sections with blanks to populate, you know, sections to, to do. Why not have them do it? And well, that, that is a good argument. Yeah. Um, wow, I opened up kind of a can of worms with this standards <laughs> thing. I didn't, mean to, I didn't mean to suggest that, like, it's complete Wild West with, like, no idea of which way to go. but. I mean, when you look at all these different doc sites, how do you not arrive at that conclusion? It's like, anyway. Um, OK, so Giuseppe's checking out lunch. It's I think in it's, room. oh, it's in the next room? Yeah, head over. So yeah, head over. And oh, wait, we got one more comment right there. Um, maybe for the, by the end of the, uh, today's workshop, could you think about um, opening up a few minutes for um, best practices? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, certainly, We're, we'll be diving into that definitely in the upcoming two sections. So.